today i will be discussing on the parasympathetic system in the previous class i looked into the sympathetic system here i have placed a, a picture of uh, arthur levy he won a nobel prize in 1936 posthumously his work was uh, he found out a chemical substance released from the vagus he named it as a vagus stuff he did these simple experiments using the frog heart that means he has taken two frogs and uh, he stimulated the vagus of one frog and that uh, collected the um, the uh, output uh, the heart output from in another beaker or a test tube and uh, then he uh, perfused it to the other heart and he found a change in the heart rate so that was the discovery and um, he got the nobel prize in 1936 vagus stuff now we know that it is nothing but um, the um, acetylcholine okay with this brief background uh, uh, about the parasympathetic system because uh, he gave the idea about uh, the vagus stuff and the vagus is the the major parasympathetic uh, nerve because uh, it amounts for 80% of the total parasympathetic load in our body now uh, what i did uh, last time uh, I, i just mentioned about uh, the various aspects about sympathetic nervous systems from the transmission to the actions on various organs and to the functions of sympathetic system i mentioned about the adrenergic agonists and antagonists A special reference was made to canon's fight and flight response even i made a uh, brief uh, note on horner's syndrome today i first brief uh, briefly provide you the comparison of sympathetic parasympathetic uh, system events at parasympathetic terminal the cholinergic receptors and their um, the receptor and molecular pharmacology very brief very broad the parasympathetic actions on various tissue i will mention about uh, parasympathetic agonists and antagonists here what i will do is i will cover the entire autonomic uh, nervous system uh, drugs influencing the autonomic nervous system then i will uh, uh, mention about the functions of the parasympathetic system and i summarize so that is my plan of lecture now yes this is the person uh, he is with the peace peace for parasympathetic response and uh, rest and digest so actually it is the en energy conservation the, this system works for energy conservation and uh, it uh, tries to pro provide or store energy restore or uh, keep energy levels so that uh, he can go for this uh, fight and flight response so that means uh, this part of the autonomic wing is consuming or uh, spending energy uh, this part of the autonomic system uh, conserves energy this consumes energy this conserves energy so that is the difference between these two sympathetic and parasympathetic responses and similarly as as we have a fight and flight response we have um, yeah opposite opposite of that fight and flight response uh, that is the uh, playing dead so especially in some animals uh, animals like rabbits and other things uh, if a predator comes and uh, what they do is they just lie down on the ground as if they are dead then once uh, that uh, the tiger or uh, the animal passes away uh, then uh, they will run that is the Uh, type of uh, response that is uh, playing dead now moving on to the further about parasympathetic system it is located in the cranial nerves and then sacral segments the cranial nerves are third seventh ninth and the 10th 
the sacral segments second to fourth. Uh, this one I have already given a brief idea. I will just read it for you. Synapse at a ganglion located in the vicinity or within the organ. That means uh, preganglionic neon neurons uh, are longer. They reach the synapse or a ganglion that is very near, close to the organ. The postganglionic fibers reach the effector cells uh, to produce the effect. So again, the parameters of these preganglionic fibers are myelinated B fibers. They are equal to A delta fibers. And the diameter is around 2 to 3 micrometers, and the conduction velocity is around 5 to 8 meters per second. The postganglionic fibers are myelinated, and the conduction velocity 0.7 to 2.3 meters per second. The differences in sympathetic and parasympathetic I have shown in this uh, organizational chart I have already presented to you. And in this organizational chart, so the parasympathetic, you just see that it comes from the brain or the brain stem, cranial nerve nuclei, third, seventh, ninth, and tenth, and the spinal cord. They come here and then to the effector organ. And this one is being influenced by the, the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus uh, try to govern this wing also. And this hypothalamus receives inputs from the limbic system. The limbic system is in constant touch with the, the reticular system, cingulate cortex, sensory motor area of the brain. And similarly, the limbic system is monitored by the prefrontal cortex, olfactory cortex, the hippocampus, and many more areas in the uh, brain. All are uh, connected to the limbic system. Uh, just I was I was trying to make a comment on the playing dead. What happens? Uh, you see a tiger there. The rabbit is seeing a tiger, and uh, suddenly the visual inputs, uh, visual inputs uh, that is in the sensory motor cortex, they reach, and these will visual inputs. Uh, go to the sensory association area. From the sensory association area, they reach the limbic system. Now, along with this sensory association area, that would go to the prefrontal cortex. In the prefrontal cortex, the decision is made whether I am going to survive or not. So now, the prefrontal cortex says that, no, you will, uh, the tiger will eat you or kill you. So then it will say that it will send it to the limbic system. Now it is not the amygdala. Amygdala is an aggressive uh, nucleus that increases the sympathetic activity. It is the septal nucleus. Uh, that septal nucleus is activated and the septal nucleus uh, increases the, the autonomic uh, parasympathetic activity. That is again uh, coming through the hypothalamus and to the, uh, the parasympathetic thing the entire muscle tone and the reticular system is activated. The muscle tone and everything will be lowered. Even the respiration becomes uh, slow. And uh, the uh, everything as if the animal is dead. That is how it lies down. So this is what the uh, organization as far as the parasympathetic system is concerned. And another important thing I want before I leave this slide here, that uh, the meditation, what we concern, the meditation increases this activity. So that means you are sitting in one cool place and trying to internalize yourself, internalize yourself. And when you are doing that, you are trying to suppress the, the amygdala activity. Amygdala activity is going towards this side, sympathetic activity. Amygdala activity of the limbic system. If that is the amygdala activity is decreased, the septal activity increases and the septal activity increases the parasympathetic outflow. That is uh, what uh, we see in uh, yoga and um, especially the meditation. Meditation, that is the effect. Now, moving on. So this is the organization of the uh, autonomic nerves. You have this is a central nervous system. These are the neurons in the central nervous system. We have the somatic system, one nerve doctrine and the parasympathetic system here, the long preganglionic axon and the short uh, postganglionic axon. 
this is a uh, ganglion which is uh, within the organ or near the target organ. And here the sympathetic system, I have two components there. One, the para or perivertebral chain of uh, nuclei. These are the things. And this is the adrenal gland or adrenal medulla. So that's the adrenal medulla. This uh, dark, uh, red, red arrow indicates the hormone adrenaline uh, released into the blood. This is the endocrine component. Now, at each level, here, 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 this is all uh, acetylcholine as a transmitter at the preganglionic pre terminal. Then in the postganglionic terminal, here, in case of a parasympathetic system, it is acetylcholine as compared to this norepinephrine or epinephrine. Okay, so now, uh, briefly about, because this is the synapse, again, I'm trying to bring in and I try to uh, call you on a uh, different, different perspective of the synapse. This is one of the synapse, acetylcholinergic uh, synapse. Uh, let us say that uh, uh, synapse at the, the vagus and the, um, the cardiac muscle. Let us imagine that. Now, this is the presynaptic uh, post uh, terminal, terminal there. And the this is the vesicular uptake or the vesic vesicles. This arrival of the impulse in the presynaptic terminal would uh, make this uh, acetylcholine containing vesicles to reach the target cell, target cell, and uh, move from uh, interior to the, the membrane site or the active zone. Once it releases, it produces exocytosis, released into the acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft. This is synaptic cleft. And now this synaptic cleft, depending upon the type of receptors, whether it is a muscarinic receptor or nicotinic receptors, produces the action uh, on this effector cell. Now, this uh, acetylcholine, which is released here, is being active, inactivated by uh, the, or destroyed by the acetylcholine esterase. So that means uh, it will be destroyed or it is catabolized into choline and acetate. Now, acetate is used in the uh, whatever the TCA cycle as a substrate. So, choline, the choline uptake uh, transporters are here in the presynaptic terminal. The choline is taken up, and now this choline, uh, with the help of the energy the mitochondria provides, uh, and an enzyme, choline acetyl transferase. So, choline, again, in the acetyl choline coenzyme, you, you just see that acetate. Acetate now it is being recycled as acetyl coenzyme because I said that it enters into the uh, Krebs cycle. So now acetyl coenzyme A, this acetyl coenzyme A plus choline uh, are um, joined together to form the acetyl choline with the enzyme choline acetyl transferase. Now this uh, acetyl choline is packaged into the cycles and then uh, put back. Okay, that is about it. Now, I have shown one autoreceptor here. This is one of the autoreceptors located on the presynaptic terminal, the M receptor here and the M receptor here. So this is a muscarinic receptor, this is a nicotinic receptor. This is what I have mentioned uh, on the other side. Uh, moving, uh, it, what are the different type of uh, cholinergic receptors? Cholinergic receptors are broadly divided into two, nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. This is a classic pharmacology. Nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors. The nicotinic receptors are located on the ganglion. That means the preganglionic, uh, uh, at, at the ganglion of the autonomic system, whether it is sympathetic or parasympathetic. They are also located in the skeletal muscles. The skeletal muscle, they are the nicotinic type of receptors. And or in the neuronal cells in the nervous system, because in the nervous system, again, we have a nicotinic and uh, uh, col uh, muscarinic receptors located in various parts of the, uh, the brain areas, basal ganglia, the hippocampus, and uh, even in the hypothalamic areas or reticular system areas. Everywhere they are distributed. And these... Uh, Actually, the nicotinic receptors are the, they are particularly the ligand um, gated ion channels 
or these type of receptors are known as iontophoretic channels. So that means uh, uh, arrival or the acetylcholine sits on the nicotinic receptors and that opens up the cation channels that produces the depolarization and then the action. That is about the nicotinic receptors. Now we have in the muscarinic, uh, we have uh, here five receptors, M1, M2, M3, M4, M5. So this is according to the molecular pharmacology, depending upon the receptor, uh, the molecule, uh, their affinity, their agonists, antagonist interactions, the reactions, and all those things put together, they are classified. Now, broadly, these uh, receptors, because if you are looking at these receptors, when they are activated, they will open up the cation channels. Here, these are uh, like uh, these are channels of which uh, mediate the reactions with the uh, G protein coupled responses. That means uh, they, the main ligand is the G protein. Now they they sit on the G protein uh, uh, ligand and then brings about uh, the activation or inhibition. That means a GQ or GI or G1, GO activation. So that means uh, it produces. Uh, the either of the activation that produces the sig this is a signal transduction that means uh, the m2 receptors the acetylcholine sitting on these receptors and uh, muscarin is an agonist and uh, of the acetylcholine now acetylcholine is there it is sitting on these receptors when they sit on the receptors that would activate the g protein at gq gi or uh, g1 go something like that that is a molecule that signal transduces and after that uh, either there is a activation of the phospholipase c either there is a uh, suppression of the adenyl cyclase activity or uh, that is inhibition or there may be an activation of the ip3 ip3 and uh, diacyl uh, uh, glycerol activity that is not shown here that also that also would come so this uh, this is about the cholinergic receptors and their actions on the entire effectors now what are the actions of the parasympathetic uh, nervous system on various uh, tissues i am taking in the same order as i had taken uh, in my last class here first i start with the eye the acetylcholine uh, produces a contraction of the sphincter pupillae. So that means uh, that produces a meiosis. Meiosis, that is, uh, if constrict, pupil constricts. If the cholinergic activity increases, uh, the pupil constricts. So that is one thing. So that means uh, when a light falls, falls on the retina, and this light goes to the second cranial nerve, the optic nerve, then optic chiasma, then goes to the pretectal area, then the linear vestibular nucleus comes, and from there it will activate the third cranial nerve nucleus. And this third cranial nerve nucleus is having a, um, a motor component and autonomic component. Autonomic component will produce the const a contraction of the sphincter muscles, that is circular muscles. The contraction of the circular muscles and produce the, uh, the aperture is uh, decreased just like your camera. Now, that's one part. This is a typical light reflex. Now, there is another thing. When we are seeing a distant object and when we are seeing a near object, what happens? There is a ciliary muscle which holds the, which holds the lens, the, the lens. You can just see that lens. And when this suspensory ligament when the ciliary muscles are relaxed, the suspensory relaxed or um, tense. When the ciliary um, mus muscles are contracted, suspensory ligaments are slack. And by slackening, the, the diameter of this, diameter of the lens uh, increases, especially uh, you can just see that this is the anterior and this is anterior uh, diameter and the diameter of the lens increases. So that means the convexity increases. So that means when I see from a distant to near vision, there is a constriction of the pupil 
that is one component the second there is a co increased convexity of the lens that increased convexity is because of the slackening of the uh, suspensory ligament and uh, this is known as a accommodation reflex accommodation reflex so this is a component of the uh, the ciliary muscle contraction is by the third cranial nerve one third cranial nerve uh, contracts the circular muscle that is the sphincter pupillae third cranial nerve uh, contracts the ciliary muscle and uh, this is necessary for accommodation for the uh, near vision or uh, the relaxation in case of a distant vision that is one component one of the part of the uh, parasympathetic action on the eye now second comes the the parasympathetic action on the heart if you if you st the Otto Levy experiment, I just again uh, come back. When he stimulated the vagus, uh, it released uh, a chemical, what he named it as a vagus stuff. Now, this is known as acetylcholine. And this acetylcholine uh, produces a number of effects on the heart. One on the pacemaker cell. SA node is the pacemaker of the heart. And we have a M2 receptors here. And uh, uh, when vagus is stimulated or when acetylcholine is applied, this activates the M2 receptors. The M2 receptors decrease the heart rate. How that is, uh, uh, how that is decreased? That decreases the slope. You just, uh, just don't worry about that. It is a slope of the prepotential. That slope of the, this is the slope of the prepotential. You just see this. Uh, orange one this is a slope of the prepotential so in case of it when uh, when we apply acetylcholine this becomes like a flat flat thing so if this is a flat it does not reach this threshold level this is threshold this dashed line is a threshold and it will never reach the threshold heart is stopped so that means uh, so this will monitor the activity of the SNO and uh, if it is happening slowly the heart rate is uh, slowed down or decreased if it is uh, in case of adrenaline i said that this slope will be faster this is the rate of rise is faster that increases the heart rate and it it has uh, this is one on the rate that is a chronotropic effect that is a chronotropic effect then on the contractility this is called enotropic effect ionotropic effect or enotropic effect on the atrial and ventricular muscles, uh, again through the M2 receptors, this is again a GPCRGI uh, mediated mechanism. They would uh, uh, decrease the contractility, uh, that means through the cyclic uh, GMP mechanism, they decrease the contractility of the uh, smooth muscle or the cardiac muscle. The contractility of the cardiac muscle, that is one. Now, also, this is called a Inotropy, inotropism, chronotropism. So then the the excitability of the entire uh, excitability of the entire cardiac muscle is decreased by the parasympathetic activity. That is uh, excitability is a um, bathmo, bathmotropic action, bathmotropic action. Then we have the conduction of impulses from SA node to AV node, AV node to the uh, Purkinje fibers and the bundle of E's. So that conduction of through these conducting uh, um, media, so that is again, uh, it's called a dromo, dromotropic action or it increases, that sub, this decreases the conduction. So it decreases the conduction. So that means uh, the the parasympathetic nerve produces the negative actions on the heart. One negative chronotropic action, negative inotropic action, negative bathmotropic action, negative dromotropic action. Dromo is conduction, bathmo is excitation, eno is ino is uh, contraction, and chrono is uh, rate. So we have what is called a term, what is called as a vagal tone. It is the tonic activity of the vagus on the heart. A continuous tonic activity of the vagus on the heart. The activity of the vagus on the heart is inhibitory. So that means it is con continuously 
influencing the heart in an inhibitory or it is inhibiting the heart. For that reason, the heart is beating at a particular rate. Say, for example, I have a heartbeat of about 70 per minute. So that means this 70 per minute is because already the vagal activity within me is continuously inhibiting it and that is why it is 70. Suppose if I block the vagal actions, one thing is, one interesting thing is you cut the vagus. Okay, when you cut the vagus, the heart rate increases. Okay, that you can do in an experimental animals. But in human beings, it cannot be done. So under that conditions, we can atropinize. We, we give atropine. Atropine is a blocker of the acetylcholine at the muscarinic receptors. So when we atropinize, the vagal action on the heart stops or is not present. It is blocked. So once you will get the increase in the heart rate, and that increase is known as a vagal tone. I again tell, now say for example, here is a person with a vagal uh, heart, not resting heart rate is uh, 70 beats per minute. After atropine, his heart rate become 150 per minute. So that means a difference 150 minus 70, that is 80 beats is because of the influence of the vagus, a tonic inhibitory activity of the vagus, that is vagal tone. Now in athletes and sports persons, there is more vagal tone. So that means their heart rate is just low. You may find you may find a number of sports personalities whose heart rate is uh, uh, just below uh, 60 or uh, 50 or something like that. That is one. I have already mentioned the vagal tone increases with age. And again, as it happens in the elderly people, the vagal tone again decreases the heart rate and start increasing. After 60 or after 65, the heart rate start increasing because the, uh, the parasympathetic activity diminishes. Personality. Suppose if a person is there all the time, restless, worrying, so that means the vagal tone is being uh, modulated by the, the stress the personality is having that would uh, increase the heart rate. So that is the personality. Then the state of mind. I mentioned about the state of mind. In the state of mind, I mentioned about the meditation. If you are cool, you are sitting down, introspecting in a, a proper environment, so then the vagal tone is high. The vagus activity is high. Then species of the animals. Some animals are uh, purely parasympathetic. They are cool animals. They are timid animals. Some animals are aggressive, purely sympathetic. Say, for example, here in our own day-to-day -day, uh, day -day environment, we have these cats and the dogs. Dogs may be cool, so you love, love their uh, behavior. And the cats, uh, they are uh, really aggressive. So the whole entire cat family, uh, they are no different uh, to each other. So that means the, this is the species of the animal. Say, for example, the tiger, lion, and all those wild animals, uh, they are uh, sympathetic dominance. The rabbits, the deers, and all these animals, especially these are timid animals, and they are parasympathetic animals. So this is the species of the animals. And I mentioned how to determine the vagus, uh, vagal tone. This is determined by atropinization. You give the atropine injection, you can determine. Or else you can determine by cutting the vagus that can be only possible in experimental animals. What are the actions of the parasympathetic system on blood vessels? Uh, to make you a very blank uh, blanket statement, a very blanket statement that the, there are no cholinergic fibers supplying the blood vessels. The blood vessels are all supplied by the adrenergic or sympathetic fibers. 
the parasympathetic nerve supply is not there to the blood vessel smooth muscles you just see that coronary not supplied skin not supplied skeletal muscle not supplied the abdominal viscera not supplied renal not supplied systemic veins no but in case of salivary glands it produces a dilatation you must have been taught you must have been taught in the, um, the parotid gland or uh, the salivary gland regulation of salivary gland secretion what happens uh, this uh, acetylcholine that uh, the uh, either the seventh or a ninth cranial nerve that releases uh, along with uh, along with uh, transmitter acetylcholine that uh, releases kinins along with it or activates kinins now these kinins dilate the blood vessels you know what i'm talking about it's not acetylcholine per se it is because of the release of the additional chemical that is a kinins or bradykinin and that would produce the dilatation that would produce the sweating the increased blood supply to the uh, parotid glands uh, so that secretion continues so that is about uh, uh, the uh, so it's not an exception here here it is something uh, in between coming that is how the blood supply the vague, the parasympathetic uh, uh, supply to the blood vessels no then comes the parasympathetic actions on the uh, bronchial muscles the bronchial muscles they produce a spasm or a contraction again i have mentioned here receptor m2 receptors it produces a uh, contraction then in the stomach yes you have the vagus supplying the uh, the entire stomach that would have a number of other mechanisms one it increases the motility and the tone of the this thing and that, that is through the empty and it produces the contraction and uh, again there is a, another important aspect there is what is called a receptive relaxation receptive relaxation as with the food enters the stomach it tries to accommodate more and more food so that is a another that is the tonus the tonus is getting changed and uh, this is because of the the interneuronal activity is altered then sphincters the sphincters are relaxed that would allow movement the secretions are increased so whether it is the secretion of a water enzyme or anything and it will also increase the secretion of the gastrin in case of stomach gastrin on one side histamine on one side uh, on the other side and all those uh, products are increased same is the case with the intestine in the intestine the motility and the tone are increased the sphincter activity is relaxed that is the ileocecal sphincter or internal anal sphincters they get relaxed the secretions of the intestine what is called the succus entericus is increased so that would increase the the water enzymes and other things coming from this uh, intestinal glands gall bladder it produces the contraction of the gall bladder smooth muscles internal anal sphincter it relaxes on the parasympathetic actions on the uh, kidney ureter and bladder so maybe here the uh, uterus also all the pelvic organs i am trying to put in one urinary bladder detrusor muscle it is contracted by the uh, parasympathetic activation and uh, the sphincters sphincter vesicae is relaxed the sphincter vesicae is contracted by the adrenergic uh, components so that means this opposes the adrenergic that is what we say as a physiological antagonist the uterus its uh, action is highly variable depending upon the the uh, hormone profile of the individual or hormone priming of the uterus either estrogenic progesterone and that would be uh, on the uterine myometrium it performs an important functions in the penis especially the corpora cavernosa the the muscles here are relaxed they are relaxed 
and because of the relaxation of the muscle there is a pooling of the blood and this pooling of the blood because the pooling of the blood makes the erection of the penis and this erectile response is mediated by the nerve coming from the sacral segment sacral segment and this uh, erection is initiated by the release of acetylcholine and this acetylcholine in turn activating the nitrogenic mechanism nitric oxide mechanism this nitric oxide produces the relaxation of the corpora uh, cavernosa smooth muscle and this corpora cavernosa smooth muscle relaxes the the blood accumulates in the uh, interstitium and that would produce the erection of the penis so that is one of the important uh, function of the uh, parasympathetic nerve and this nerve especially the sacral nerve is known as a nervi erigentis so this is the nerve which produces the erection and uh, in contrast if i were to take uh, the sympathetic uh, component sympathetic component is necessary for ejaculation ejaculation that means the emptying of the seminal vesicle and the emptying of the uh, vas deferens that is ejection or ejaculation uh, uh, reflex so that means in the uh, reproductive functions one the erectile function or erectile response and another is a ejaculatory response ejaculatory response is sympathetic and the erection response is parasympathetic both are important here so if there is no ejection there may be erection if there is no ejection he is not able to produce or reproduce he is uh, almost uh, impotent not he is nearing to sterility the erection is a erectile dysfunction he may be potent he may have the ejaculation so these are uh, minor details we will talk about these things when we talk about uh, uh, the erectile dysfunctions now about the skin there is no supply to the piloerector pilomotor muscles there is no supply to the sweat glands mind you here the sweat glands uh, receive sympathetic cholinergic inputs the parasympathetic actions on the liver no no supply adipose tissue no supply because it won't you don't want to break down the fat it does not want to increase the enhance the liver activity and the pancreas yes it increases the exocrine activity of the pancreas so that uh, enzymes and the uh, bicarbonates are synthesized and by that uh, the digestion uh, digestion process is facilitated so the digestion and assimilation of a food facilitated the storing of the energy is taking place endocrine it excites the beta cells of the pancreas for insulin secretion again uh, trying to uh, store uh, the glucose because insulin increases or allows the intracellular uh, uh, glucose uh, storage it allows the glucose uh, uh, storing then salivary glands uh, mucus glands are supplied by the uh, sympathetic nerve the serous glands are supplied by the parasympathetic nerve and they produce a profuse watery secretion the serous glands parotid is mainly serous sublingual is mainly mucus submandibular is a mucus and serous the lacrimal glands lacrimal glands that glands which produce a tears tears they are activated and there is a secretion secretion that is why you you see you see that whenever you have an emotional outburst the lacrimal glands uh, start uh, they are activated the emotional outbursts are associated with uh, the sympathetic parasympathetic uh, modulations and these sympathetic uh, parasympathetic activation uh, that would stimulate the lacrimal gland and lacrimal gland in turn increases secretion once there is an increased secretion our eye uh, chambers are the outside in the conjunctival sac it cannot hold a cardio conjunctival sac it cannot hold the water and uh, you will have those uh, uh, tears uh, dropping in that is more secretion that's a lacrimal gland so now how the parasympathetic nervous system 
Mediate section and the various receptor subtypes I have already mentioned. Again, I repeat here. So I have here mainly mentioned three type of uh, receptors, M1, M2, M3 receptors. These are muscarinic receptors. These are ligand-gated G-protein coupled receptors. So N1 and L2 are the nicotinic receptors. These are uh, ion antiphoretic receptors. They, they open up the uh, cation channels. Now, M1 receptors, the prejunctional endings of the, uh, the pre skeletal prejunctional endings increased acetylcholine release. M2 receptors are located in the lung and the presynaptic parasympathetic uh, nervous system endings on the visceral organs and the, uh, the blood vessels. All these are mainly the M2 receptors. They inhibit uh, uh, the acetylcholine release, uh, they inhibit acetylcholine release in lungs, whereas in visceral organs, they increase the acetylcholine release. Here, the, the skeletal junctions, they increase the acetylcholine release. In lung smooth muscles, especially the bronchial smooth muscles, uh, M3 receptors produce bronchoconstriction, that is contraction. Then uh, the, P, the peripheral parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system ganglion, they have these N1 receptors. This uh, would produce a response and a ganglionic blockade. And the N2 receptors are present in the skeletal muscle. That is a neuromuscular junction. Neuromuscular junction is the N2 receptor that would produce the, the muscle contraction in case of the somatic uh, muscles. Now, the parasympathetic system as a sensory are carrying the uh, visceral sensations. Similarly, the sensations of the, the buccal mucosa, the entire oropharyngeal components, and the, the up to the vagus, they are carried by the glossopharyngeal nerve and vagus nerve. Now, here again, these are carried by the, the vagus, vagus nerve, the parasympathetic components, you can just see that uh, it is the beyond this line, uh, especially the distal, because it will supply up to this uh, mid of the uh, transverse colon and subsequently is coming from the S234, S2, parasympathetic S234, and uh, uh, this one, and the uh, trigone, trigone region, the prostate, urethra, and um, all these are supplied by the S234 segments. Now we have the in case in case of the uterus and the cervix, cervix and the, the upper vagina are supplied by the sacral two pole. So this is the uh, level of uh, the nerves supplying the different organs, uh, uh, visceral organs, uh, um, visceral organs by the parasympathetic nerves. That is what I, I have mentioned. Now coming back here, uh, broadly. Uh, this is parasympathetic division. I try to uh, just to summarize uh, in the ciliary ganglion, it is coming through the third cranial nerves. It produces a dilatation, uh, constriction of the pupil, and it produces the accommodation. That is a, a contraction of the ciliary muscle uh, to increase the curvature of the lens. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, seventh and the ninth cranial nerve, and, uh, they will, uh, through the otic ganglion or uh, pterygopalatine ganglion, they will supply these uh, salivary glands and the lacrimal glands. They are secretomotor. Then through this uh, tenth cranial nerve, supply the lungs, the trachea. And uh, the tenth cranial nerve, the vagus, supplies the heart all parts of the heart. Then remaining part of the vagus that will supply the stomach, the liver, the pancreas, other viscera, other viscera of the uh, abdomen. Then they will supply up to the level of the uh, transverse colon here, transverse colon. Then remaining part, the sacral segment will take care of the terminal part of the large intestine, rectum, and the anal sphincters, and uh, then uh, we have the bladder, and uh, they are controlled by the sacral segments. Now, the the penile carpocavernosa muscles are supplied by the pelvic nerve, 
that is necessary for uh, the penile erection. So on this side, we have the uh, sympathetic system. Just uh, uh, you just see the opposite of that. Uh, here it is dilatation, it is constriction. It increases the secretion, it decreases the secretion of tears or the whatever. So then we have it supplied to the, the from the thoracic or lumbar outflow that supplies the lungs, heart, the liver, the intestine, the adrenal medulla, adrenal medulla is the major. So this is what uh, uh, broadly about uh, the supply. And one interesting thing that uh, the blood vessels do not receive a parasympathetic inputs. The functions of the parasympathetic system, I just want to summarize here, or uh, just to give you the broad idea. Uh, there may be more functions anyway. So these are, uh, one can uh, think about. It is essential for the conservation of energy. That's the rest and the peace. And the parasympathetic system is for protecting the animal so certain animal creatures in they are playing dead or even you will uh, your activity will slow down and you will go to uh, what i will say uh, sleep or you will be sleepy if you are uh, if your parasympathetic activity is uh, um, affected so then there may be somnolence so that means a tiredness or uh, you feel that you don't want to do any activity uh, that that type of a thing that is uh, that's coming here the playing dead. It is parasympathetic system is essential for the accommodation reflex for a near and a distant vision. So that means the curvature of the lens through the ciliary muscle contraction and relaxation, and necessary for uh, preventing the excess entry of light or the proper entry of light, the pupillary dilatation or constriction the pupillary constriction broadly. Then uh, regulate blood pressure and other cardiovascular functions. Parasympathetic system. Vagal tone, it is a cardiac activity monitoring and checking. It will regulate the bronchial smooth muscle contraction and respiratory activity. And it will be a secretomotor to all the exocrine glands so that means it secretes the it increases the secretion and it is uh, uh, also produces the uh, the movement or the motor activity or then erectile response penile erectile response stimulate endocrine pancreas to release insulin produces somnolence somnolence that is uh, coming up here. Somnolence is uh, uh, going to sleep or uh, not being activated. Regulate smooth muscle function, including the sphincteric activity of the entire viscera. Sensory function, that means afferents from the cranio and sacral parts. So from the thoracic and uh, some up to the esophagus level, up to the esophagus level, they are buccal, pharyngeal and esophageal things are carried by sensory then uh, pelvic uh, areas uh, by the craniosacral parts these are the functions of the parasympathetic system briefly i go uh, here the drugs that affect autonomic transmission drugs that affect the neurotransmitter synthesis hemicolinium and metyrosine they will uh, affect the neurotransmit neurotransmitter synthesis and here, hemicolinium is a, a stylcholine terminal, metyrosine is a, a norepinephrine terminal. In this case, it blocks the choline uptake, slows the synthesis. In case of uh, metyrosine, it inhibits the tyrosine hydroxylation and thus blocks the synthesis. Then neurotransmitter storage, visamicol and reserpin. These are two things. Visamicol, it will be on the a recycle of the acetylcholine neurotransmitter. Recycles of the acetylcholine. This is in the cholinergic nerve. Reserpin is in the norepinephrine or catecholaminergic nerves. And what happens? It one this visamicol prevents the storage of acetylcholine 
whereas uh, risorpine uh, prevents the storage of norepinephrine and catecholamine. Neurotransmitter release, that means uh, various, uh, that means norepinephrine, dopamine, acetylcholine, prostaglandin, and amphetamine, they, they all interfere with the neurotransmitter release. Especially these uh, norepinephrine, dopamine, and acetylcholine, prostaglandins, they are situated presynoptically. These are presynaptic autoreceptors. They inhibit, uh, uh, is, uh, located on the cholinergic or norepinephrinergic nerves. They modulate the neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter uptake mechanism, the cocaine and uh, tricarbolic acid, uh, PCA, they would uh, they increase the uptake. This happens in the adrenergic nerve endings and uh, they inhibit, uh, these inhibit uh, uptake and prolongs the postsynaptic actions. That means whatever the actions, uh, that is why you will see that uh, the person who is con consuming cocaine, uh, he may go into fits and the convulsions and they may die uh, of uh, some excessive active adrenergic activity. Uh, many of the sportsmen, they are uh, using cocaine for uh, improving their uh, um, performance. Uh, that is a uh, doping. Uh, neurotransmitter inactivation, uh, these are the drugs. Uh, these are hydroponium, neostigmin, physostigmin, uh, DFP, parathion. These are uh, known as arginophosphorus compounds. These are arginophosphorus compounds. Uh, parathion is the uh, whatever this uh, mosquito repellent and other things are uh, mosquito. Uh, the heat and the whatever the drugs you use, uh, these are the things. So they what they do is they inhibit the stylcholine esterase. And this inhibition of the, these are uh, reversible inhibitors. These are irreversible inhibitors. So this acetylcholine inhibition inhibits the acetylcholine esterase and prolongs the postsynaptic action of the acetylcholine. Now, coming back with the adrenergic uh, system, adrenoceptor activators, activators, alpha-1 receptor phenylephrine, alpha-2 receptor clonidine, Beta-1 receptor dobutamine, beta-2 receptor albuterol, ritoridine, salmitrol, terbutaline. And their site of action is on the sympathetic postganglionic fibers, blood vessels, piloerector muscles, the radial muscles of the, the eye, where they will have the pupillary dilatation. The heart muscles, the bronchial muscles, and uterine small muscles. Their mechanism of action is through the Increasing the IP3 uh, diacylglyceryl cascade, that is an alpha 1 receptors, or decreasing CAMP adenyl cyclase activity at alpha 2 receptors. In case of a beta, it is uh, increasing uh, CAMP and uh, uh, adenyl cyclase activity. Adenoceptor blockers, these are phenoxybenzamine, generic, non specific or a specific at alpha-1, rajosine or terajosine, at alpha-2, ehombine, beta-1, and beta-2, propranolol, and beta-2, etinolol, and esmolol. So they will act at the 